Many of the platitudes we encounter about leadership can be thrown out the window when we meet people who deeply embrace who they are and then take on the challenge of leading from their authentic selves. In this show, we talk to Rebecca Hull, a leader who's comfortable exploring her journey and the ongoing challenge to confront the difficult issues of a changing workplace. This conversation will help you think about business, transformation, diversity, difficult conversations, and the well-being of your people in new ways. Rebecca embodies the very idea of the evolving leader. Hi, friends. Welcome to The Evolving Leader, the show born out of the belief that we need deeper, more accountable, and more human leadership to confront the world's biggest challenges. I'm Scott Allender. And I'm John Gomes. How are we feeling today, Mr. Gomes? Oh, I am feeling full uh, to the brim. Um, and so when, before this uh, this conversation, I just went for a walk and tried to, to kind of shake off a bit of that. It's been a very busy time. I think we're in the, in the crazy season. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I'm feeling quite overwhelmed by just the amount of um, stuff that's happening, not just in my own world, but just in the outer kind of, um, you know, the outer. So, yeah. How are you feeling, Scott? Um, I feel heavy, uh, not just because it's Halloween week here and I ate half of my kids candy this week. But uh, I mean, that's probably part of it. But I feel uh, I feel heavy about uh, a lot of things going on Uh out in the world, as you mentioned, um, some other things going on in my family. And so that definitely is, is sort of coloring the week. Um, but I'm also feeling a bit of gratitude and curiosity. Um, and just glad to be here with you today. So, um, and our guest is today we are joined by Rebecca Hull and Rebecca heads up the digital experience agency at TPX impact leading 125 people who deliver digital transformation across the nonprofit education and healthcare sectors. And today we're gonna to talk to her about how her leadership formed around a commitment to help create sustainable outcomes for people, communities, and the planet, all while juggling her role as a single parent to two daughters. And Rebecca believes that great leadership comes from sorting out her own, our own selves first and her leadership philosophy driven by purpose, compassion, and self-mastery extends beyond the boardroom. She's a self-described conscious leader, always working on herself, being present, and holding space for others to do their best work, which we love and are all about here on The Evolving Leader. So Rebecca, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. And what a lovely intro. I love that question. How are you feeling? Because I think when you're asked, how are you? I mean, how do you answer it? It's like, yeah. Okay, I think, but I think the question, how are you feeling, really gives space for people to arrive into the conversation. So I love it. Well, Rebecca, that's lovely to hear. So let's ask the question, how are you feeling? I mean, I it, what you're saying really resonates with me. I think it's a really hard question to answer at the best of times. And at the moment, I... We're just sort of living this duality of like, how do you reconcile having this life of privilege with all of the atrocities that are happening in the world? And you know, what are, what are you, what are we allowed to feel in these times? So I think, like you, Scott, I'm trying. I feel quite Friday-ish. Uh, my brain is definitely not fully optimised on a Friday afternoon. Um, but I, I'm also really trying to feel gratitude for, um, for. The things that I have in my life, and you know, it's really times like these that you focus on. Um, you know, the, the the basics that we take for granted. So, I feel grateful. I feel a bit tired, but I feel um, really happy to be here. So, thank you for having me. Can we start with your origin story and the experiences that shaped your belief that we need a uh different type of leadership to face a more uncertain world? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, it's a long story. 
of which there are different strands that really, I guess, coalesce as to um, as to where I am today. So, um, I I grew up in a very um, volatile, um, traumatic environment, actually, and um, there was no ambition for for me. My um, sort of first act of rebellion was to go to university. Um, and the path that was set out for me was to be a secretary. <clears throat> and I didn't want to be a secretary, but I also didn't want to displease the people who wanted that life choice for me. So I chose business studies as it was the closest thing that I could imagine. It was in an office. I hope that that would appease. And um, I guess I sort of I, I set out on a path not really knowing what I wanted to do, um, but having a real sense of wanting to make a difference and I think some of that really came from um, you know out of adversity comes kind of inspiration and a desire to be better but also I was lucky enough to be offered an opportunity to have a part-time job um, in um, a business called The Body Shop um, at, at, which was set up by an amazing woman actually who was well ahead of her time, Anita Roddick and she started this uh, business from her kitchen creating sort of toiletries and cosmetics um, that were kind of designed or to be sustainable to um, and, and she was the first person of her kind I think in that space to start to talk about business being a force for good and the shop that I worked in she came into a lot and she was this incredible force of nature and she used her shop windows, this was sort of back in the late 80s, early 90s, to raise awareness around issues such as domestic violence or the hole in the ozone layer or, you know, recycling, um, deforestation in the Amazon. Like, no other business was talking about this stuff as far as I knew. And she made this really big impact on me about, you know, it's like, it's more than just us, it's more than just a transaction. And although I wasn't aware of it at the time, it really so to seed, I think, in the back of my head around the sort of environment that um, that I felt was nurturing, um, you know, to, to the wider community and to the planet and the sort of environment that wasn't. So I set out on my merry way. I kind of graduated um, in a recession and started working and did lots of different jobs. And I ended up being long haul cabin crew for actually for quite some time and that's a whole podcast in itself but what I really got the opportunity to see because every time you fly you um, you fly with new crew is really to see leadership in action it was like a very condensed um, ex uh, sort of experience of understanding team dynamics and what works and why were some people really impactful from that first moment and why weren't they and why did some trips feel amazing and why did some trips feel really awful and what was going on and so I ended up uh, working in digital transformation decided I was sort of lucky I taught myself into a job as being a project manager and I guess really you could say that's where my career started and you know, I'm a woman in a technology business and I have spent a lot of my career being the only woman in the room or one of very few women in the room. And I've had a lot of experiences that were, you know, were not optimal and um, I didn't see a lot of people like me being, um, you know, being in the workplace, making a positive contribution. And... And I think that really lit a fire. I think I sort of set myself a challenge to see if I could make a difference in that space um, and, you know, create the pathway so that we were able to bring more kind of diversity into, into this industry. So I observed from a very early age that the majority of people in business were men and if they weren't men, they were women, and they were women who were really embracing the masculine energy or kind of almost having to act or adopt that very masculine alpha energy to be taken seriously in the room. And if there's one thing I'm not good at, it's I'm really not good at being something that I'm not. And I thought, I have to make a choice. 
I can either make this really stressful for myself by trying to be something that I'm not, or I just go with who I am and I just see, and I go with my values and I lean into who I am and I see where that takes me. And and so far, it's it's uh, it's been a squiggly journey, um, but so far it served me well. And yeah, I'm really passionate about people, and that's such an easy thing to say. But I think it's a really hard job being a human, and you can't disconnect all of your stories that we carry around with us ourselves as we go into work. And you've got to create workplaces where people can um, be recognised for who they are, where their nervous systems aren't shot to pieces and they're in a state of really high activation all the time. Um, and if you can do that and you recognise and you meet people where they are, it's actually really good for business. And I think that's what people don't realise. So that's, that's my pathway. Um, I spend a lot of time outside of work, really interested in the whole mind-body um, paradigm and I guess my life outside of work feeds my life in work as well and there's a lot of reciprocity there that, um, that I'm very grateful to have. Can you um, just give us a sense of um, what you do today, what your business is about um, before we move on to some of the issues facing you as a leader? It's um, so I'm going to give you the wordy answer and I'm going to give you the answer I'd give my neighbour. Uh, so we are a digital transformation business, a digital experience business. What does that mean? For most people that means websites. Um, but you know, it's much, much broader than that. And so what we help our clients do is to really embrace um, the power of digital to um, meet their user needs. So that could be through service delivery, it could be raising donations, it could be increasing membership. Um, and digital experience used to mean websites, it means a lot more now, it's apps, it's really any kind of digital touch point. And that journey starts right at the kind of the problem statement, the opportunity statement. Um, and then you're kind of building strategy and then you're building products and then you're optimising them and you're testing and learning, testing and learning. Um, and it's a fascinating place to be in, particularly in this day and age, because I have a very um, complex relationship with technology. There's um, technology in and of itself is, is not bad, but it can be used for good and it can, it can also have a really detrimental impact. Um, and so we really try and use technology and, and digital to bring about sort of positive outcomes and drive impact. A lot of that philosophy is baked into our design. Um, so lots of people don't understand that, you know, digital experiences going on the internet has a really big carbon impact. Um, it takes a huge amount of processing power to run websites, but you can choose to build, to have sustainable design, which reduces your impact on the environment, impact on the planet. Lots of experiences are not designed for people who have um, you know, additional needs around accessibility, some kind of impairment, for example. Um, so we really try to bring in the tenets of sustainable, accessible design um, and only using technology where it will drive a positive outcome for an organisation. Can you give us a sense of the, the market norms within the digital transformation agencies and, and particularly the ones that you feel you really need to change? Yeah, um, they are lots of stereotypes around digital agencies and you know they often exist because they're true and um, historically and it's still very much the case today um, technology and digital has um, been very underrepresented across genders a distinct lack of diversity across ethnicity, across sort of um, LGBTQI plus representation, that the levels of diversity and inclusion are very low. And that hasn't always been a conscious thing, but you know, typically the people that have access to resources to start up businesses to be in that space came from a place of privilege, often white men. And you have an unconscious bias to hire in your profile, to hire how you understand um, the world to operate. And you know, my experience of working in this industry now for over 25 years 
is um, that the levels of diversity are uh, extremely low, that the feeling of inclusion as a result of that has been very challenging for lots of businesses to achieve. Um, and that has an impact not only on your employee experience and your talent, but also who you're designing for. You know, you're designing for a plethora of um, needs out there. And if you don't have diversity in your workforce, you're probably not bringing out the best in your design either. Agency tends to be um, quite high stress, high pressure. So historically, there's been a very big culture of work hard, play hard. You know, they have been the businesses that have had ping pong tables or, you know, Friday beers, Wednesday beers, pizzas in the office. Obviously, some of this has changed now with the pandemic, but there was a reason for that. It was to keep people in the workplace for longer. Um, and work-life balance uh, tends to be um, quite hard to achieve. Lots of pitches, lots of deadlines when you're working, client-facing. That comes with a set of demands. So high stress, I would say, low, um, low levels of inclusion and low levels of diversity. Not many people, I go to many CEO agency leaders, technology leader type events. Not, I don't mean many people who are like me. So what needs to change to change that? Like how, do we, how do we get more, bring in more diversity? I think, um, well, well, first of all, you have to accept that there is a problem in the first place and you have to really educate yourself about you know, where your own biases might be in yourself and in your business. And you've, um, you've got to think really hard about what it means to have an inclusive business. Um, it, it, takes, it takes work, you know. There's often a reason why businesses have a certain culture because it's much easier to manage a business. It tends to be quieter if everyone is aligned in a certain way and thinks like each other and you know, has the same thoughts and opinions and wears the same type of clothing. Um, but you've got to accept that there's a problem and you've got to want to understand why it's better for society if you change that and why it's actually better for your business. Businesses that have a higher level of diversity tend to perform better, they'll keep their staff for longer and they're producing better outcomes for their businesses. You know, there's lots that need to be changed. You need to work really hard to make people buy into your vision, buy into your purpose, create a space where people feel psychologically safe to be themselves, reveal aspects of themselves that perhaps they've kept hidden in the workplace before. And you've then got to deliver on everything that you say you're going to do to keep that trust. Um, I mean, when, I, when I, I've started roles and, and in my current business, I've been in my current business for six years, I was the only mother. Um, and that's not unusual. I've had to leave the workplace by the fire exit before to go and pick up my kids from nursery or school. You know, I've had the stress of a child being ill in the night and actually needing me to be really present with the fact that they're unwell. You know, um, but actually what I'm really worried about, was really worried about, is what am I going to do tomorrow? How am I going to turn up for work tomorrow? What impact is that going to have? That's not serving my workplace, it's not serving my child. But that was my work reality for a really long time. And... Um, yeah, I'm happy to see that that's changing a little bit, um, but but probably not fast enough. And the the loss to business is that women leave the workplace. So let's hone in on that a little bit because you've said so many important things in there. So I'm thinking about the changes that have happened since COVID, right? So we had at least spaces where people, you know, we had sustainable spaces, at least in theory, in terms of helping people to unwind, to regulate their nervous systems. You talked earlier about how people bring their whole, whole stories, all their stories, all their life experience to the workplace. They're carrying that. And then they're often in environments where they're dysregulated. Their nervous system is always in this sort of heightened experience. So what is your 
approach to with your team into creating a sustainable place where people can share how they're feeling, where they're not dysregulated all the time? How are you how are you showing up in that as you lead your team? Well, there's so much to unpack in that and we talk about it a lot in in um you know, within our sort of leadership community and within our wider team. I mean, first of all, I think it's really important that as a leader you walk your talk and your what I talk to my team about is, you know, we are all a product of, you know, the five nervous systems that we most commonly engage with at any one time. So if as a leader in the business I'm in a state of high activation, high stress then the chances are that's going to filter down to other people. So we've got to check ourselves all the time. Where are we? Where are we coming from? You know, in conscious leadership, they talk about this a lot. Are you above the line, below the line? And the truth is we're going to be fluctuating in and out of those states all of the time. But if we can start to create a practice of, you know, how am I doing? Where am I, where am I at? Because if I know where I'm at, I'm probably going to have a much better sense of where this other person's at. So, you know, we start lots of meetings with a check-in like we had today. How are you doing? Is there anything that you need to attend to so that you can be here to, um, you know, to be really present in this room? I talk to my team all the time, you know, I all the time about... I fundamentally believe that you do not do your best work on a screen, behind a screen. They are empowered to work wherever they need to work, to structure their day in the way that they need to structure their day. Nothing makes me happier than if someone says to me, I'm going for a walk at lunchtime, or I'm going to do, can we do this as a walk and talk meeting? But, you know, it's, it's a constant challenge, and it's a constant challenge for two things, in that I'm serving clients that don't necessarily understand this paradigm that I'm trying to to create for my business so there's a certain amount of reaction that needs to happen but what I've noticed is that you can take people that you can take the proverbial horse to water but you can't make them drink and I think that ways of working and stories that we bring to work about productivity or um, are uh, you know create a sense of people not able or not wanting to take responsibility for their own regulation. And so, you know, I fully empower my teams, my executive team, my senior leadership team to create the workplace that they want to work in. And I can say to people, you can turn the notifications off your Slack. I don't have any notifications on my phone. I don't have it on my laptop. You know, you can say no to a meeting you can excuse yourself from a meeting if it's clear that you don't need to be there but in but getting people to recognize that that might be something that's good for them to do requires a lot of coaching and particularly in this work from home or more remote environment where it's harder for people to see you in action you need to coach the behaviors in a lot more than you might do otherwise um yeah i fundamentally believe um that work is just one dimension should only ever be one dimension of 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 our lives yes that would be peak, peaks and troughs but you know ultimate ultimately we we work to live and not the other way around um and i you know i don't want people in my business feeling that their lives are out of whack because of something that's going on in work. Let's have the discussion, you know, and see how we can support that for you. We create space for a lot of conversation. I have mental health first aiders, lots of businesses have that now, but we really encourage, you know, connection and engagement. We create a lot of different platforms for people to surface questions and concerns. Um, and they and they use those and we actively respond to them you know we have a culture of we said that we did we would do this and we have done this or we haven't done this we try and hold ourselves to account and I think that helps but the work is never done and everything is always in a state of flux so it requires you to be conscious and aware and commit to that style of 
leadership every single day, every hour. Because sometimes the temptation to just go is, just do it, just do it, please just do what I'm telling you to do. It's strong, you know, when you've got it, move quickly. But the path of, you know, least resistance for you at some point would be to be much more direct and dictatorial about just do it this way, but actually it's counterproductive in the long term. So this is, this is the interesting stuff about for me about this style of leadership is... You know, it could be perceived by some to be soft or a bit hippie-ish or, you know, experimental. It takes a lot of work to be a conscious leader. A lot of work. And when we talked, Rebecca, um, a while back, you, you were talking about how difficult a lot of this has become because of COVID and you've got a new set of challenges about mm. trying to create a culture in that environment, but you're, you, you've got, you know, ways that you're working around it. Can you talk a little bit about what you've learned about the, uh, you know, trying to work in this new hybridized environment? Yeah, it's, um, I'm going to raise a lot of questions today. I'm not going to have all of the answers, but I'm, I'm okay with that. I think it's just good to have the dialogue. And, and we are, um, this is something that we're very, very mindful of, particularly as I think it's, it's changing all the time. You know, what, what do we even mean by hybrid working? What we meant by hybrid working three months ago is not what businesses mean now. And again, you know, I... It's, it's such an you know an interesting and complex topic because you know truthfully, if I'd have had this way of working when my children were younger, my life would have been much less stressful, and it would have been a much better experience for my children. Absolutely, that's true. I think the ability to work from home to have a more flexible life is a good thing for society. It's a good thing for future generations. It's a good thing for the planet. It's made work much harder, like absolutely much harder. Um, and you, you, the loss of those soft connection moments, the, the loss of people learning by osmosis, the loss of um, that kind of playfulness that sometimes happens you know in the studio when you know something funny happens those moments of bonding they're so much harder to initiate and create in in a remote world um so it's it's constantly on our agenda and you know i i definitely don't profess to have all of the answers we try and create that sense of connection and community and ritual. Um, so there are touch points in the week where everybody comes together um, and people know what to expect and there's the opportunity to engage. And we really have to sort of almost... Um, it feel, it, it's, it's interesting. We sort of, so we've done an experiment recently where we've got people to sort of almost like reintroduce themselves to each other because it's it's harder to maintain those relationships if you're not in constant connection or that understanding of each other. Your connections become weaker. So we've used, uh, you know, these ceremonies that we have in terms of different meetings to get different teams and people to really kind of introduce themselves and talk about themselves more to each other. We've got channels where we encourage people to recognise, high-five each other for great work to reach out where an opportunity where they can um you know amplify a moment of connection or solidarity or something that went wrong on a project and becomes a, a marker you know we have something that we talk about as the three c's where we come together around three principles so i haven't mandated you must be in the office x amount of time but i've said you know there are times where it's really super valuable for us to be in person those tend to be moments you know around creativity where you need to do collaboration or where community so if you're a community of designers come together and hang out with your other designer pals you know if there's a problem to be solved it's so much easier I'm old-fashioned it's so much easier on a whiteboard and post-it notes often 
and you know and obviously client is a really important moment where we try and foster those moments of magic with our clients in person but it's hard now it's really hard um lots of clients lives are in flux um people have moved out of london travel times are longer and i think that people have what i'm observing is sort of like a bit of a loss of social muscle and I think we were talking about it, John, you know, you made a really great point about people are so much more bonded to their homes. Now, actually, to break that bond is, you know, subconsciously quite a big thing for people. And what I'm exploring at the moment, do quite a lot of reading around sort of belonging, connection, tribes. And what I'm exploring is, you know, can we build smaller groups and communities of people so people feel that there is a smaller community that they're part of my team's working projects so it's up quite often in a state of flow their teams won't be the same um, and then the increase of polarization actually of different needs so the other thing that i've observed is the needs of your introverts and extroverts are much more pronounced now. Some people actually just don't need to leave the house, they don't need it, and they're very comfortable with just getting on with their work, but the people who need that connection are really missing it. And the thing that really keeps me awake sometimes is, um, what does this mean for young people in their experience of work? What does this mean for the leaders of the future? You know, so much of what we've learned, I think, and what I've been really lucky to learn has been through just witnessing stuff in action, you know, overhearing a meeting, seeing how someone else does it, that kind of little walk to the sandwich shop where you just get to exchange a problem with someone, you know, uh, really important moments, and they're much harder to create online. Yeah, and I, I think what we're we're seeing um, a lot in our our work is this polarized reaction to, mm. you know, not necessarily always characterizing it as CEO, but sometimes it is the CEO going, "I want everybody back in the office," and um, yeah. and actually, it's such a it's such a black and white kind of directive that it it cuts across a lot of the the new realities that people uh, have come mm. to expect from work and I think one of the things that you're talking about here which is really interesting is that people have become much more aware of their needs because there's yeah. been more reflection more introspection more um, focus on mm. this people have a chance to to think about these things and and yes the the the, the bond with home is interesting um, but also like what do I need mm. to be successful at work mm. and um, you know, so there's a whole range of things, purpose, sustainability, social needs, work productivity needs and so on, that people have been given this moment of massive autonomy to be able to do that. Mm. And now you're trying to undo that autonomy and go, no, you're back to mm. an, another deal, which is uh, yeah, I need you here in this way on this time and so on. And people are reacting to that in a, you know, they're using their power. So I'm, I'm interested in yeah. um, that that kind of paradox that you face as a leader in managing the needs of the people and the needs of the business and how do you how do you get an adult mm. conversation about that with people I mean I think to some extent I'm I'm in a fortunate position in that people come and work in my business because they are really motivated by the work that we do and the clients that we work with so you know I would never experience a problem. Everyone understands if a client wants us in a room, we're so happy to be in a room with them because it, that builds a relationship. It makes life so much easier in the long run. And it's really, really valuable to the long-term relationship. So getting people back in person around client activity isn't a problem. Where I notice it to be um, more of a an expressed preference is um, perhaps between disciplines. So I definitely don't want to stereotype here. 
if you do a job where you need to go quite deep and it's quite detailed if you're an engineer you just don't have the same need for social contact to understand what's going on in the sales process as a sales process sales person needs to understand what's going in on in a project over here or an account manager over here so those it's it's absolutely fascinating and I and I can't wait to sort of fast forward 10 years actually to see what what does it look like in 10 years because pre-pandemic we were absolutely an in-person business and we had a lovely studio and we and it was fun and we had dogs and uh you know and you know we like moments of just pure magic you know absolute magic and pandemic happened and we all went home and we were a bit like oh this is like how long is this going to go on for and obviously it's now the way of being and I can see that the people who really enjoyed those moments of magic are really mourning the loss of them and trying to create them with a community that's actually a bit smaller because some people can't or some people you know won't get involved um it's you know it's it's difficult for them to to feel like it's the same workplace that it was. In reality, it is. And what I'm definitely noticing in my business as well is that I have quite low attrition. Lots of people are growing up with a business. And, you know, if you can be at home with your kids, of course you're going to choose to be at home with your kids. Um, So we're definitely going through, like, a cultural evolution. Um, And... There are some days where I really miss it and would just love to click my fingers and just have everyone in the room. But I also accept that now that's a lot for people to do and it's almost too much, which is why we're exploring, you know, actually, is, you know, do you need to get 120 people together or is it okay to just be in your communities or be in much smaller groups? And that's really a question that we're trying to answer at the moment. I'm curious about how you find your diverse talent, people who want to be part of, you know, this kind of culture you're describing in, in an industry which, you know, is, is sort of known for um, transactional and churns over uh, up to 30% of its workforce every year, really. So how, how are you finding the talent to build the culture that you're trying to create? Um, lots of lots of different ways. Um, so we've really overhauled our recruitment process to remove any risk of unconscious bias that might come into that process by hiring managers. So, you know, um, anonymous CVs, making sure that, you know, the the process that, that it's being hired to is totally objective based on your skills and experience for the job, not necessarily on how long you've been on the job or... Um, anything else that might introduce an element of bias. We go to places where we try and find, you know, where that more diverse talent is likely to be. It's not always easy. You know, we've run some programs with, you know, women who code, girls in tech kind of programs, and we're starting to see really good representation, gender representation in our engineering teams. We, you know, We have created, um, we call them ERGs, they're um, these employee um, groups that really Mm -hmm. represent resource resource groups, groups, exactly, thank you, Um, that are representative of different areas of diversity that we're trying to um, create a space um, to flourish in. So we have a women's one neurodiversity, ethnicity, and LGBTQI+. So we will involve these groups in in everything that we do. So we don't get a person from our people team to write a policy on the menopause. We speak to the women's ERG and say, women who've experienced the menopause, what does it feel like? What should this policy look like? So there's a lot of co-creation with those groups around the employee experience, the employee value proposition, and also what's the best way to sort of amplify and get ourselves out there so people feel like this is a place of interest I think you know we do have the benefit of doing purpose-led work and um, you know that that 
uh, helps us have a really healthy funnel of people who are interested to work with us because they are also interested in the work that we want to do. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, we, the stats around our gender split are 50-50, uh, which in tech is amazing, 50% representation in the leadership team as well yeah. between gender. I can't remember, the, the average is about 20, 23. In all elements of um, the um, representation, we are above the UK average. And we monitor that really closely. That's excellent. Yeah, we ask, we monitor things. You know, so I think something like only 35% of businesses in tech would even sort of capture data around um, you know non-binary status in terms of gender for example you know we will ask that we've been capturing data around neurodiversity for a long time um, so we're really well equipped to support those people in the workplace how do you um, go about confronting difficult conversations what's your approach so that you can confront you know bad behavior unaligned values um, with care, how do you do it? So a, a pillar or a commitment of being a conscious leader is a sort of a commitment to having candid conversations. Um, and, you know, you. I learned very early on in my career you can never make assumptions. So there's, there's an element of preparation that you need to do. Mentally, am I in the right space to have this conversation? You know, try and discharge any emotion that you may have around it and take a step back and really think about the bigger context. Go into that conversation and ask a lot of questions. What's going on? This is what I'm observing. Let's Can we talk about it? And in fact, I was talking to a few people in the business this week about the term feedback and, and, I, and I was, you know... So I had this thought that actually that even that term is a bit triggering, you know, when we think about a sonic experience of feedback, it's scratchy, it's this, it's just like actually what we're really doing is trying to get to the bottom of a situation where we can make an outcome better. Um, and so you, I've learned many, many things in, in my career and one of them is, one of the best things that you can do for people is to be upfront, honest, clear and direct. Don't beat about the bush, don't leave them guessing. If, there's, if something is falling short, be really clear on why is it, you know, why is it not okay that it's falling short? Where, where's the gap? What do they need to do? What, and, then, and then what do they need? What support do they need to get there to close the gap? And be really clear about what your expectations are and check in, you know, check in. You can't just have a one and done conversation and leave them in a state of... Um, you know, being aware that those conversations are going to trigger like shame or fear or anger, you know, like you've got to give them a, a chance to, to talk through, um, to talk through some of that. We ask people, I encourage my line managers to talk to people about how do they like to receive feedback. Um, some people just want the upfront conversation, some people need to reflect and digest, so... Where that's possible, we, you know, we um, have a culture of, again, sort of creating the optimal environment that that conversation can happen, you know, and it needs to happen. It's healthy, you know, to have disagreement, to have, you know, we talk about one of our values is, you know, is around collaboration and collaboration is not easy. Collaboration is not everyone being nice to each other. Collaboration is being in a room managing a difference of opinion, managing different sets of emotions and getting to an outcome that moves you forward. Um, and there is no point shying away from that if you want to be in leadership um, because it's inevitable, conflict is going to happen. I like your observation around mm. the word feedback being problematic because mm. um, mm -hmm. I've never heard anybody saying 
genuinely I love feedback I mean they say this may say it no. but <laughs> the actual emotional experience of it, they don't they mean mean it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and your point about trying you know the goal of trying to get to the bottom of a situation um, mm. also is a bit problematic as well but it's much healthier it's a much more kind of um, yeah. solution orientated thing because I think feedback comes with the obvious implication of judgment and that, you know, immediately mm. puts us mm -hmm. into a heightened state mm. of fight or flight. You know, if I say to you, I've got some feedback for yeah. you. <laughs> <it's> like... <laughs> exactly. And the chances are it's probably right. And the chances are, you know, that reaction is maybe telling you something that perhaps, mm. that, you know, is something that you need to listen to. But I've, um, yeah. I don't know, I just... I I do quite a lot of coaching work with my teams to support them because this this is not a space that feels comfortable for anyone to move into. But you know, trying to get them to understand about having those conversations, like don't it's not you can't make it personal. It's not personal. It's about it's about behaviour and outcome. When you do this, it has the impact of that. It's really obstructive for what we're trying to achieve. How do we do that differently? Can we do that differently? But it also, you know, I think it comes back to this point about to be a really effective conscious leader, you've got to you've got to accept the work in helping your teams become conscious of of themselves. And what I observe sometimes is because of design or luck or stories people end up in jobs that are perhaps not suited to their strengths and it's highly stressful and they're forcing an aspect of themselves that's really difficult and it's not their natural state and then that leads to a um you know to to an outcome that's not that's not great for anyone so then are you really having a conversation about well this thing happened that wasn't great or is it better let's try and have the conversation about how are you feeling in your work actually is this the right place where do you want to go you know what can you know what's going on for you that I can support you with or what do you feel like you need space to go and figure out and I think some of my team probably get fed up with me having that conversation with them but I think that that's ultimately what helps move it move it on in the long run what else should we be asking you Rebecca Jeepers, that's a big question for half past four on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, you've stumped me. What else should we, should, we, should we be asking? I mean, I'm really... I'm really interested and concerned for young people entering the workforce. You know, I think it's really stressful being a young person in this world you know we I think we may we always had big stuff to live with but we weren't living with the threat of climate change being as big as it is we didn't we weren't educated in a pandemic you know we um you know we had people showing us a way to do things that may have not been right but it's still a kind of a benchmark or a north star and I think it must be incredibly hard to be a young person entering the workforce where your experience of work is through a screen and you are grappling with an economic reality, you know, much greater levels of mental health and anxiety than I think former generations have had to deal with. Um, and I don't hear enough about workplaces doing enough for, uh, you know, to really consider that as something that perhaps needs some love and attention for the future. I, I was um, talking to somebody um, recently about their talent journey from, from people joining the company to leaving the company. And, and mm. what they were saying was that, that they put a lot of effort in bringing new people in. You know, the onboarding experience is very good. The um, promoting people to um, the biggest jobs in the organization is very good. Mm. But the, actually, for everybody else, for people who are in this kind of middle state where 
they're almost yeah. neglected you know there are certain the 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 key really is about continuous workplace training and good reviews and that's about it mm. um which kind mm. of leaves people in a in a quite a, 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 a strange position um in terms of their growth and adaptation given all of this change that's taking mm. place in the world and i just wonder what you think about that yeah i think it's um I, I think it's a sort of a genuine reality and I, th I think that there are some kind of competing factors going on. I, you know, work in a business where we give everybody uh, a set amount of money that they can put towards any sort of learning experience that they that's going to help them in their work and, and that's not necessarily about you know, it must be 100% connected to your job as a designer if somebody wants to go and explore something else, but it brings in an element of creativity or innovation. We absolutely support that. I'd say the uptake is, um, is not as big as you would think it is. We have to um, remind people it's there. So I think, I think for some people, there's a big... There's so much, and we talked about it at the beginning of this conversation, we're so cognitively stretched that sometimes it's quite hard for people to create the space to think about their own development. And I also think that businesses don't do enough to describe um, interesting... I think we talk about progression and, um, and maybe we, you know, or, yeah, progression, which I always think has, like, quite vertical connotations... And maybe what we really should start talking about is like learning and growth and like really embracing like what are you curious about, you know, rather than it being um, this sense of, well, it must be something that furthers me in my career. How about just something that furthers you as a person, you know, something that you're interested in? And I think, you know, one of your, you know, your questions was about, you know, for me, you know, what's at the cutting edge of, culture and what next and I think it is this sort of question around creating space for people to really feel into things and explore things that are of interest and to not be so linear about everything. Maybe because education wasn't a given for me I've always been really passionate about learning and you know, some people are like, oh, I'm not sure about this course. I'm like, like, go, if you just learn one thing, if you take away one thing, it'll have been worth the time and the money. Um, but, but getting people to create space for themselves is really hard. Mm. I love that. I think that's a great place for us to land. And I want to say thank you. Thank you. For having this conversation. It was refreshing and there's so much richness in everything that you've said and so much sincerity that just comes through in, in everything that I, I know everybody's listening is appreciating that. And so thank you for your time and your insights. You're very welcome. Thank you for, yeah, thank you for your time and inviting me. It's a privilege. <laughs> I, I feel calm as a result of talking to you. <laughs> I do as well. Yeah. I do as well. And I needed that. I need that. I feel less heavy uh, as I did at the beginning. I feel more hopeful um, knowing there's leaders like you out in the world that are leading with this kind of intentionality. So, so thank you for that. And for our listeners, remember, until next time, the world is evolving. Are you? Are you?